Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very glad to uh, moderate uh, this uh, session. And um, this is session, the title is Hong Kong Experience. Um, we have uh, uh, four panelists. Uh, they are going to talk about Hong Kong's experience in particular with the PVP OVOR related projects. Uh, let me uh, first uh, giving uh, the stage to the speakers and each of them, would you please briefly introduce yourself? Can I start, uh, just start from that end? Yeah. Uh, professor? Yeah, my name is uh, Yong Keng Yang, and, and now I'm uh, a professor in Tsinghua University. My research field is in uh, public management and also uh, some project in PPP. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Jacob Kam. I'm the Managing Director of MTL Corporation. I'm responsible for our global uh, railway operations as well as our mainland Chinese uh, business. I'm Ben Ting Xi from Free Technology Group. Uh, we are a leased company in Hong Kong. Uh, we so called Wu Doctor, which is uh, uh, related with uh, road maintenance and construction also a uh, machine manufacturing business as well. Thanks. And good morning, I'm Liu Xinfeng from Airport Authority. I'm the executive director responsible for strategic planning and uh, long-term planning for the airport. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, uh, what I'm trying to say, uh, this session is a Hong Kong experience, and uh, you will see this Hong Kong experience is from another angle. In the past, we have been heard quite a lot in terms of Hong Kong's uh, advantage, in terms of the Hong Kong's financial systems, in Hong Kong's legal systems, and the superconductor, uh, whatever we heard uh, quite a lot. But uh, this session is trying to tell the, uh, uh, the audience we're presenting here, it's uh, looking to another angle of the Hong Kong's uh, specialty. So uh, without further ado, uh, may I invite um, Dr. Kim first to have a presentation about um, MTR and how MTR is operating on those uh, PVP projects. Dr. Kim, please. Uh, good morning again, uh, ladies and gentlemen. If I could have my uh, slides up, otherwise it would, if there's no slide, it would have been the uh, the shortest speech ever uh, in our history. Um, I just, um, if we go to yeah, the, uh, yep, the next slide, please. Um, for the guests uh, uh, um, in, in Hong Kong, I think I'll need to explain to you uh, who we are. Who we are. Uh, despite all the stories that you might have heard about us being a property company or a station commercial company, if I were really a railway company. Um, our global business now actually spans over uh, the major part of, uh, of Europe, uh, well, several uh, countries in, in Europe, uh, mainland China uh, um, and, and Australia. And of course, our route uh, is in Hong Kong. That's also our largest operations. But in terms of route length, now we operate over 1,200 kilometers of uh, metro uh, uh, city uh, railways. Uh, and that is uh, four times uh, larger uh, than what we have. So we operate four times more railway uh, outside of Hong Kong uh, than in Hong Kong. We carry uh, over 14 million passengers a day, uh, although more than half of that uh, passengers are actually carried uh, in Hong Kong. So we're primarily uh, a railway company. Uh, we have investments uh, not only in Hong Kong, but also in mainland China, in uh, Beijing, Hangzhou, and Shenzhen. And we have a small project in Tianjin as well. Uh, we also have investments in Sydney, Australia. Uh, for the other countries, including uh, Melbourne, Australia, uh, London, and Sweden, uh, we're primarily an O&M uh, operator, just responsible for the operations and maintenance, but not uh, heavy uh, investments uh, in those railways. Um, just a piece of information um, will be, uh, we are actually operating the London Crossrail. Uh, in, by 2019, when the full line is open, we will rename uh, the Elizabeth Line, which is the line named after the Queen, uh, and imagining um, a British custom, uh, British client decided that they would give the line to a Hong Kong operator uh, to operate. If I could just quickly flip through the next uh, uh, two slides. The first, really, just to um, I'm sure everyone knows the. If I have the next slide, please. Um, 
the, uh, the importance of uh, railways, especially railways in cities. Um, I, won't, I won't go through the detail, but of course, uh, I'm sure we all know about the high capacity uh, of, of railway than, for example, private cars on roads, and of course, the high energy efficiency uh, per passenger trip, as well as the low carbon emission friendly to the environment. If I could go to the next slide. Um, um, this is actually a very important factor for city development, which is the efficient land use. Compared with, uh, for example, uh, buses, um, the, uh, a pure underground railway will use only about 5% uh, of, of the land uh, to, pr to provide the same carrying capacity as buses. If you need to build all the roads for buses to carry the same number of people, you need 20, 25 times more land than an underground uh, railway. And of course, uh, even in countries with abundance, uh, say in land, uh, in their cities, land is still the most valuable asset uh, for the city. So any um, mass transit methods that can economize the use or optimize the use of land is, um, is a major consideration. The next slide, that will show, um, in fact, more than that, um, a, a railway actually creates significant uh, external benefits or benefits external to the railway itself. So imagine, or uh, you can visualize the increased intensity of economic activities, the saving in traveling time. Um, uh, some would associate railway with high uh, uh, apartment or high uh, housing uh, prices. In fact, it's actually the other way around. If you imagine a, a piece of land that can only accommodate uh, a number of people, let's say 10,000 people, with uh, a, a railway, in fact, the land can be better used. We can accommodate three to five times more people on the same piece of land. In fact, it's a better use of the limited land supply, especially uh, inside cities. So the external economic and environmental benefits uh, uh, to a railway is significant. Uh, I'm just giving you an example in the two new lines that were just built in Hong Kong West extension of the island line and the South Island line. Uh, the net present value benefit, uh, just looking at from the government perspective, this is real dollar value, not, not the other um, uh, 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 benefits. It's already uh, 40 uh, billion uh, Hong Kong dollars uh, net present value. But in terms of our turn, it's amounting to 300 uh, to 400 uh, billion plus over the next uh, 30 years. That is more than sufficient to pay for the railway itself as well as bringing benefits to the company. Uh, however, if we go to the next slide, and then there is, uh, there is a, a weakness uh, in railway. Uh, that is the poor return in the railway invest investment itself. Although it, railways have significant external benefits, the internal investment return is low. Um, mainly because this is something uh, probably un unusual for, uh, uh, for our guests who are familiar with, for example, road investments. Um, for railway, we need not only the initial investments, which is, which is uh, shown here, okay, but also frequently, uh, regularly, we need ongoing additional investments. And these are significant investments. Now, all the uh, we're, not we're not talking about profit, we're just looking about net uh, cash flow. All the cash flow that are generated from the uh, operations, we have to pay for not only the initial, the big, uh, <laughs> the big well there, we have to fill the initial capital, but we also have to pay for uh, all the replacement of trains, you know, after you have used it for several years or uh, uh, 50, 40 years, you have to replace them. Signaling system have to be replaced every 20, 25 years. Uh, comms system, uh, computer systems, everything uh, have to be replaced in a span of uh, uh, 30 to 40 years. So it's actually, usually, it's the ongoing investment that actually kills uh, our railway uh, uh, projects. But a lot of people, a lot of including governments, do not recognize the ongoing investment needs. And that's why, eventually, some of the railways will, de will degrade because they lack uh, ongoing uh, investments. Um, and for most places, in fact, the green is not that much because of, you know, the fair level that is set by rules or with 
uh, set with uh, uh, political considerations. Uh, a lot of the uh, countries, a lot of the cities, uh, they don't even have a positive green part. Okay, they will rely on uh, government subsidies just to maintain day-to-day -day, uh, operations, uh, let alone uh, considering uh, ongoing investments. So even for MTR, we have uh, a, a positive return, but our return uh, on assets, it's around 1.5% in the last few years. Now this is not a level of return that will attract private investment. Private investment will not be interested in a long-term investment that will only bring in one to 2% return. So how do we resolve that? Uh, you either reduce the amount of investment through uh, uh, other means, or you uh, enhance the income. If we have the next few slides, I'll quickly look at some of the ideas uh, that we have developed, that the, the world has developed over uh, some time. For example, PPP is an example. We either reduce the initial or ongoing investment, or we divert some of the external economic benefits. As we know, railways actually bring in significant uh, external benefits. We can bring some of those in into the railway to subsidize uh, the investment. So rail plus property is where we have extensively used in Hong Kong, and uh, transport-oriented development, which is similar in, in many ways, using the land uh, uh, that are benefited by the railway to subsidize uh, the railway. And of course, the more important part is with the private investment participation, we enhance the value for money. We improve the efficiency of operations, the quality uh, of the service that we deliver. Uh, next slide, please. And if we look at the MTR experience, we have, uh, we have PPP models in Beijing, four lines, or three lines rather, and Hangzhou, one line. Similarly, we have the Northwest Rail Link, which is a new, uh, a new line. And also, Shenzhen Line 4, which is on a BOT, which is one form of, of PVP. Uh, in fact, the government actually builds the first section of the line, we build uh, the second section and operate the full line. Now, in Hong Kong, we also have experimented other uh, subsidy, other uh, investment models, including like initial cash subsidy, I'll uh, explain later, and also concession models. And of course, rail plus property model is uh, what has been extensively used in Hong Kong. We we'll go to the next slide. Um, now, the, uh, uh, I won't go through the, the text in detail, but if we look at the, the full life cycle uh, of, of a railway uh, franchise, we have the initial investment to build the line, uh, I split it into, cons into two parts, part A and part B, just to help to explain. So that, just imagine, uh, for example, there could be civils, all the tunnel structures, stations, and so on. And then also part B, the e &M, the electrical, mechanical, and the trains, okay, so we can invest in the trains, the control systems, uh, the communication, the air conditioning, and so on, which we normally call part B. And of course, after we build the line, we have to operate, uh, which is called operations and maintenance, and then we have ongoing investments and improvement uh, in assets and so on. So these are the major components in a, in a railway uh, um, a project or railway investment. Now for PVP, uh, basically government uh, will finance and build a part of the project. And then the investors, the green part uh, will be the private investors' responsibilities. So through um, the involvement in the investment and, and construction and the O&M, we improve, hopefully, the value for money uh, uh, and the quality of service. And of course, we have to manage the ongoing investment as well. Now, using this same, uh, same chart, I try to explain the different uh, models. If we go to the next slide, uh, I mm -hmm. talk about the initial cash subsidy. Basically, government uh, is a building part A to pay for part A. So the construction risk is then uh, managed by the uh, investors, so they actually manage uh, that part uh, of, of the project. If we go to the next slide, which is the, um, next slide, please. The concession model, in fact, uh, several of, of the lines in Hong Kong are operated under the concession model. Basically, government has already built, financed and built um, the lines, and they actually lease the lines to us to operate, but we're also responsible for ongoing investment as well as upgrades. Okay, so, um, so this is another way of uh, uh, public, the government, and the private investment uh, partnering in making uh, uh, the railway lines work as well as improving uh, its performance and service quality. 
If we go to the uh, next model, which is the, uh, next slide please. The well plus property model, which is uh, what we use in Hong Kong. In fact, the private investor, in this case MTR, is responsible for the full uh, cost and operations of the project. However, through the property development rights, the public actually injects some of the external benefits into the railway to help to make the business case uh, work. Now, there is an advantage of this. A lot of the railway, I'm sure you probably know around the world, when they build a railway, they bear no uh, consideration of the, of the environment and the, and the land that they go through. So, uh, because they don't own the land, okay, whether they maximize external benefits or not is not their subject. Okay, they want to economize in the railway, uh, either the construction or the operations <coughs> of it. But if the land value or the surrounding economic activities is related to the railway, actually encourages the railway to, to build uh, the line in a more responsible way so that it can fully protect the surrounding environment and to increase land value because they know that in due course some of this land value will go back to them. Now if I could then uh, very quickly, uh, I won't, uh, the next slide, uh, it's actually just a summary of what I just said. So um, if, you <laughs> if you understand what I've been uh, uh, saying, I don't think I need to go through uh, this, this uh, slide again. Now this is not a full uh, this is not a lecture, it's just a sharing of our experience. So I won't go through the full PVP uh, uh, um, um, uh, 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 body of, of understanding. If I can go to the next slide, this is just a list. Um, in fact, there are various forums uh, that the public and the private could work together. So I won't go through that. In fact, uh, someone did the count, uh, academic uh, research actually uh, did some summary. There are 10 uh, different types uh, of uh, 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 if we take the broad sense of PPP, there are 10 different types of investment models, uh, cooperation models that we could consider uh, to be uh, uh, PPP. So in fact, today we have only looked at, um, for example, um, this is the concession model, uh, the BAT, which is really uh, the Part B, as well as the uh, uh, Shenzhen model. And the, in fact, the private funding initiative is actually very much related to the rail press uh, property model. Uh, there are 10 different groups, and that is for uh, another occasion. If I go to the, my concluding uh, slide, uh, basically, if I could summarize, uh, railway actually, uh, railways are able to create significant uh, external benefits to the society, both economic as well as environmental uh, benefits. And PPP is one of the ways that we reduce investment intensity so that private investment could participate uh, in this uh, and these projects. So very quickly, uh, I have summarized some of our experience in MTR. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I invite uh, Benting Xi to uh, have a presentation? Yes. Benting, thank you. I'm Penjing Si from Free Technology Group. Next slide. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, just, just a little bit uh, give you a briefing about my company. Uh, actually, we are a real doctor. Uh, we, we, uh, our business include manufacturing and servicing, contracting, and also uh, the uh, civil engineering design, and also the, the education and training. Next. So we are the least company in, in Hong Kong uh, three years ago. Uh, okay. Here you can see some our products. Okay, all this is a Repair uh, is a um, maintenance machine for the pavement. Our business cover whole China except uh, Xizhang. Okay. Okay, our uh, technology uh, can use in a different environment and different climate. Okay, even winter. 
if I find some uh, content is uh, quite difficult for me to use English, I will change to Chinese, sorry about that. And I believe the interpreter is good, so <laughs> it's no problem for you to, to uh, understand. Uh, so this project actually is um, very similar uh, very different from other PPPs. The poem I want to tell uh, uh, you is uh, how to write the specification. We really believe the scale of PPP is very important. In other words, how do you select your partner? This is the soul of the project. Ask the government. How do you select your partner for a PPP project? Currently in mainland China, sometimes I even think around the world, you know, it is very difficult because nobody knows how to write the bidding. They don't know how to write this timber specification. This is what I want to point in this PPP. PPP, okay. Uh, so I won't go into details due to time constraint. I'm going to jump a few slides because we have one advantage, which is environmental technology. Um, we're very speedy and uh, we're also very efficient in terms of volume. However, when bidding, we often stress and uh, highlight uh, fairness, openness, and uh, transparency. But a lot of times, we forget about our purpose. Our purpose is to realize the maximum economic benefits and social benefits. Open, uh, fair, and transparent, this is only a method. Therefore, how do you use tender to achieve your social and public benefits in addition? It must be on the basis of fair, open, and transparent. There is a dilemma. For example, we often say we want to be environmentally friendly. There will be some arguments for different technology. Different people have different technologies, then we don't know how to write in a tender uh, specification. And when you write it very clearly, then people will know why you have written it this way. Sometimes the government will feel uh, scared to write it out clearly, which means that you know it won't be environmentally friendly. However, environmental protection is very important. So how do you write your tender specification. Well, when I talk about public interest, it is very important. It has a few areas. For investors' benefit, we all know that. I'll skip that. The public interest, we know that if you've read different bits, then you'll know the comparison of the bidding price in one second. Second, uh, 
safety, quality, and duration, these are all public interest. And how do you describe that? What I want to say is that you need to emphasize on the results rather than the tools and methods being used. I have seen so many projects, they always emphasize on the tools and um, methods. But what we need to emphasize is the results. What is your expectation of the safety on the duration? Do you need three days or three months? If you think the citizens can receive three days of duration, just write down three days instead of writing down three weeks or three months, you know, for the capable parties, they will start bidding if they are able to do it. And in recent days, when I was discussing with my friends in mainland China, this question came up, you know, who is there the best to do the PPP? Some people say private companies, some people say SOEs. I said, no, it doesn't matter who it is. The most important is a company that will meet the public interest. Whoever can meet the public interest should win the bid. This is the most important. If we cannot even guarantee this, then any PPP has no meaning. Of course, here we talk about the duration, uh, the environmental impact, and the price, etc. So we will jump on this. Another one is social impact. So I believe that there are some areas that's very important. You know, we can uh, try to evaluate. So I think through the use of PPP model, ultimately we are able to achieve a multi-win situation. And for the government, you know, it is the best that they can uh, obtain the recognition of society at a low cost. And for investors, they're able to retain a satisfying uh, return. And in the meantime, you know, sometimes we stress on technology, new technology, but actually that's not very important. What is the key is that if the investors, you know, you believe that this is a good price, then that's good enough. Within this scheme, the government will also need to invest. You know, the government uh, wants to see social return uh, at a low cost. So this includes, you know, consideration of the uh, environment. So my next PPT. So the most important are the most are the last three PPTs. Everything in PPP is because you want to you want to form a pump, find out a pump. So there are so many pumps in the in the market. So you you use the pendulum to find out your pump. So the most important point is the specification, pendulum specification. How to write or how to uh, prepare your tenant specification. That's the most important point. Without partnership agreement, it's not the PPP, okay? So who is the best, the company? Often, this is often a um, dispute, you know. Well, in our experience in Jirong, in Jiangsu, province. This is a project that obtains both construction and maintenance. So we need to consider these six areas, for example, price, safety, quality. If we write all these elements in our tender specification, and what we write out is the requirements of the results rather than the uh, methods. Well, to give you an um, example, so you write down the result requirement. So as the owner, I can write out about the requirements for safety, duration, quality, etc. So those are the things that we are able to evaluate. So those are the most important things, you know, rather than focusing on the implementation method. For example, you write 
down environmental impact. This is, can be evaluated, for example, through low carbon emission uh, and green technology for every project that is low carbon calculation. You are able to calculate it. Whether what kind of methods are being used. You know, we have a, sen a saying that every road leads to Rome. So all kinds of different methods can be applied as long as you meet the requirements. Now I have discovered that the owners in mainland China that I meet, a lot of times they don't know how to write the tender specification. And a lot of times they write the tender and they will be compa complained. You know that anti-corruption is very serious in China. Actually, a lot of times, you know, people don't want to get involved. Actually, this is a very serious issue on behalf of the Chinese government. You know, for so many governments that I have been in touch with, the current Chinese government is the most clean. But now, they don't know how to write tenders because they are scared. If they write a tender, then there are complaints, which means that they don't know how to write, which then means that there's no threshold because they don't know how to write the threshold. Actually, for the past, for quite a long time, I have been discussing with my clients about technology. And in the past two years, for about 80% of our time, we have been introducing about the tendering process. You know, we say that if there is someone who complain about your tether and complain it to President Xi, and President Xi says, you know, we need to go ahead with this, then your tender is perfect. Well, so how did we end up in this situation? Because you know, how to write all these six requirements of the results in your tender, rather than the means, the methods. For example, duration. Duration can be very short. Some people say, I can't do it. I can't finish it in one month. For the government, you should say, the, gov the, the citizens want it to be done in one month, even one day, that's even better. You know, you can do everything. I don't mind. But in the meantime, you need to meet the quality, meet the environmental impact, which is your carbon emission. You can write it down. Then I can use that as a benchmark. For example, for free tech, we say that our technology is very strong and we meet their requirements. Because by doing so, we are able to avoid the situation of destroying some small companies. I know that, you know, I worked very hard from my 20s to 50s. I saw my company grow from a small one to a major one. We feel the pain that the young companies are experiencing. So you need to leave room for young companies to grow. So why do we protect our technology that we have today? The young will have even better technology than we have today. So we do not have to specify the means in the specification. That is to say, we don't have to talk about the technology to be used. You don't have to specify that. What you want to do is to encourage new technology, and that is most important. Now, we can go on the web and uh, see a lot of information. And I'm calling on you all today now, and that is when you write your specifications, think carefully. Everything is determined when you write the specification and choose your partner. Choosing your partner is the soul of a PPP uh, project because it will have a lot of ramifications for not only the project but also for society. For example, for our company, uh, it may mean that without technology, uh, we will uh, be able to nurture some of the smaller, younger companies. I don't, uh, I'm not afraid that one day they will pass us by, pass me by, that is to say they will overtake me. But 
I would want to see a young man that I was once overtaking me, and that is fine. So when we write the spe specifications, we are not living for one project, the project in front of us only. We have to be people-oriented, people first. We have to look into the future. We have to build capacity for the future. And so this is uh, uh, about public interest, and it's not about implementation methodology. Now, a lot of people say uh, the projects need to be completed in a very fast. And uh, in the specifications, if, uh, for, is, uh, for instance, if it also pertains to, for example, moving of residential households in the area of the uh, program or the project, then you will have to think of mm, the met methods of compensation, of removal, etc. Yes, those are important as well. Those are people purposes as well. And these are important. Please do not, because of pursuing cer certain means or methods, that you forsake the outcome. Because if you do that, society will be hurt. Don't do that. Thank you. I'm Liu Tsing Tong, um, I'm from Apple Authority, and when they organized a project to share the Hong Kong experience about um, PDP, um, we were told that Apple Authority has been regarded by many people from overseas that we are one of the most successful PDP in Hong Kong. And when I heard that, I said, I I'm afraid I have to make some clarification here. And my first opening remarks will be to clarify for you, first of all, Apple Authority is not a PDP. Apple Authority actually is a 100% owned statutory body established by law in Hong Kong. However, other government established Apple Authority, uh, it requires us to operate the airport on commercial, prudent commercial principles. So basically none of us, we are not civil servants, we are all from the market, M many of us are actually from the aviation industry, and we are professionally want to run our airport uh, to the international standard. Uh, that's where AAS at the moment. However, we do participate in uh, PUP projects, not to the extent of NTRC. We do have some small investment in uh, Hongzhou. Uh, however, today I would like to share with you an experience that we had in establishing a quite successful PUP in Hong Kong, and that is the Asia World Expo. Uh, many of you, when you arrive at the airport, you may not be aware that actually right next to the airport, there is a big exhibition facility called the Asia World Expo. That project was originally incubated in the years around 2002 to 2003. That was the time when Hong Kong was uh, suffering from SARS. We have gone through a very, very uh, bad economic downturn. And at that time, the government was thinking about how we could boost Hong Kong's economy and the economic development of Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong is a very small place. However, Hong Kong is one of the biggest uh, trading economy in the world. And the reason being, we are a very, very convenient business hub. The Trade Development Council has been doing a lot of very, very good and successful work in terms of organizing a lot of trade exhibitions in Hong Kong. However, they have come to a stage where their facilities have become saturated. So the government thinks that during a downturn, economic downturn, the best way to boost Hong Kong's economy is to help Hong Kong's exhibition industry. However, there's something very similar to the uh, railway industry. Exhibition industry itself is a very non-viable business proposition, given the heavy investment involved. If you ask someone, even if you give them a piece of land, ask them to in invest heavily in an infrastructure to organize exhibition, very few people will, will be attracted to it, and it would be very difficult to make money out of that business. And for that purpose, the government thought of a PPP model. And this is a slightly more complicated than just uh, public-private. Actually, it's the public, which is the government. They invest about $2 billion into this project, providing the biggest share of the investment. AA Airport Authority, as a quasi-government organization, we contribute to the land. And in, in exchange for that, we also got about 10% share of that facility. And then 
uh, just like what the other speaker talked about, uh, uh, tender document. We have to invite international, through an inter international tender, to invite the best exhibitor from around the world to participate in this project. And at the end, we secured a French company together jointly with a local company to become the minority shareholder. They are not only just investing, they are actually the one who actually operate the subsequent project, which is the AWE. Now, after 12 years of operation, I'm very glad to, to let you know that AWE is a very successful project. It's now almost coming up to its own saturation by now. Uh, it's very full. Every year, uh, the AWE attracts something like 8,000, sorry, uh, 8 million uh, visitors from both overseas and local to their venue. Every year they organize over 300 events, uh, both uh, exhibitions, mice conventions, uh, and even some expotainment events. And this has become a very, very popular uh, place for Hong Kong. Now if we look back as to the uh, people first concept, uh, which is I think is the theme of uh, today's uh, seminar, you were asked why airport authority would be interested in that investment, you know? And if we look at where the airport was uh, for our foreign visitor when you arrive at the airport, you know, actually you're arriving at the north of Lantau. Uh, 20 years ago, this was a fairly remote place. And that's also the place where the government decided to build one of the latest uh, 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 satellite city. We call Dong Chong there. Uh, up to now, the population is about 80,000 people. And the importance to provide a sustainable stream of jobs for the people there we need some job creation. Airport itself is a big uh, employer. Disneyland is also the other big employer. But we also want, come, want to welcome more different kinds of jobs in, in Dongchong to enable the people living there to find a job there so that they could make a good living. And the other reason why AA Airport Authority, we are, you know, we are airport runners, we don't do exhibition. Why we're interested in this project is, is because of the international nature of of a exhibition business. AWE brings along to Hong Kong many overseas exhibitors and also traders to Hong Kong. And trade alone is not enough because once you establish trade, very, very often you attract people coming to Hong Kong to establish their, uh, their offices or even subsequently maybe regional headquarters. All this will bring a lot of air traffic to Hong Kong and that is very complementary to the airport authority as a body to try to strengthen Hong Kong IA's role as an international aviation hub. And therefore, for that reason, we're quite happy to be part of that project, and we're quite happy to see it you know, to be successful after 12, 12 years of operation. We are now planning another small one, but uh, uh, probably I will want to stop here for the time being and leave some time for the other presenter. If you have time, I'm able to share another project which is in the making that we're thinking about on another PVB form of investment. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Do you want to uh, comment or make uh, okay, yeah. a few points? So thanks to uh, Dr. King and uh, Dr. Xie for your very expressive, expressive presentation and also wonderful cases. Uh, I just forget to introduce my another uh, title. Uh, last year, the Tsinghua University has launched a new research center. Its name is uh, Tsinghua PP Center. It's a joint research center between uh, uh, NDRC and uh, uh, Tsinghua University. So recently, I actually I uh, do a lot of research on Hong Kong's experience in PPP. Uh, so next, I will uh, make some uh, comments on the two cases and also share my point on uh, Hong Kong's experience to uh, OBR initiative and also uh, the mainland uh, PPP development. Given most of the audience uh, are Chinese, so I will switch to Chinese to make my comments. Uh, concerning the PPP model, the Hong Kong experience and its influence on uh, the mainland for the adoption of the PPP model and also on the One Belt, One Road region. Now, the speakers before uh, just now have uh, talked about the PPP experience in Hong Kong and uh, we, I have been doing a lot of research into a PPP model and there are a lot of uh, projects in the mainland which are adopting PPP but very few of them are very successful one can say and uh, the MTR one, the Hong Kong MTR one is a very outstanding and successful one. 
And uh, as the professor had mentioned just now, there are a number of uh, innovations there. One, uh, first of all, in a number of uh, countries, the uh, 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 some companies are not able to benefit or make money uh, from rail operation. But for MTR in Hong Kong, MTRC, they are able to be very successful and also not only operationally but also profitable because of their model of uh, property plus rail. This is the uh, first point. And the second thing which is also very important is is public participation. In the uh, mainland projects, uh, there is overlooking of this part. And also, as mentioned just now, people first. People first is important. And as we have uh, mentioned by uh, Free Tech as well, there has to be social participation. Social participation is very often overlooked, which is actually very important in any PPP project in its design, in its operation, social participation is important. So I would like to emphasize that point. And uh, it was raised by another speaker just now. We must not focus just on the means uh, and forget about the ends. This is something that we have to bear in mind. Very often, actually, for the projects, too much emphasis is put on the means, on the methodology, and not on the results. So we are not just about building construction or infrastructure. It is also about why we're building all this. What do we serve? A third point I would like to make, which is, that is, in this kind of uh, project in this kind of development, what is very important and we take into account as well as the environment. For the mainland and for the other countries, for PPP projects, this is something that's very important. The environment is a long-term issue. How can the projects be more environmentally friendly? How can they be sustainable? This is a very important consideration. And uh, there is a case that I would like to uh, comment on. And here I would like to bring up one viewpoint for your discussion. In the case studies, it has already been raised actually, and we have been talking about the social participation and also participation in the capitalization or investment. Now this is very important in the PPP model. At this point, uh, find Financing is a very important part of PPP, but it is not all of it. For companies, governments, etc., financing becomes a very important starting point for PPP, but has forgotten what PPP model is for. What is the objective? What is more important is that PPP is to raise the quality of and efficiency and quality of public service. That is a goal. This, I think, is a more con important consideration. And there's another point I would like to share, and we should perhaps look further into, and that is the operation of a PPP project. How does the government play an optimal role? Now, in China mainland, the uh, government uh, provides these projects for private operation, and it's just left to the private uh, sector for operation. So whether this is provided by the government or by the private sector, the operations, uh, in the end, the accountability falls on the shoulders of the government. The government should be responsible. So what is exactly the role of the government in the PPP project? That is something that we should also delve into. Now, and when I was provided with the agenda, and uh, it is the title is the Hong Kong Experience, I have been thinking about the uh, One Belt, One Road and the uh, mainland, the Hong Kong Experience. How can it, the Hong Kong Experience inform these two regions? Now, for the longest time, whether it is infrastructure or other um, uh, innovative uh, projects, there have been a lot of very good practice in Hong Kong. And the, uh, the mainland had been really learning from the Hong Kong experience. 
And for OBOR, One Belt One Road, it is also a very important initiative for China. It is very meaningful, and I'm sure you know all about it. And similarly, for the development on One Belt One Road, as the Chinese SOEs go out, there are a lot of difficulties that they will be meeting with. And therefore, I think Hong Kong has a very important bridging uh, role to play. Um, of course, there are a, a lot of very obvious, uh, you know, its uh, location, etc. Uh, this is, uh, we all know about all that. But what is also very important for Hong Kong is its innovation in its model. It's very innovative in its operation model. And here, they can contribute to the mainland companies, the SOEs, as well as the government. And also, along the One Belt, One Road concept, there is a consideration of culture and also of uh, transport. Now, there was this five connections concept, which was raised as One Belt, One Road was raised as an initiative. Uh, culture integration is very important. And Hong Kong is where the East comes with the West in a very peaceful and integrative manner. So this is another area where, through cultural means, uh, there can be also successful operation of projects. So this is the Hong Kong's role uh, for the OBOR initiative. Further, Hong Kong has a lot of companies which have gone out of Hong Kong, that is, uh, uh, gone out of Hong Kong business-wise. And this also provides examples uh, very good examples for the other entities to learn from, including the um, Express Rail in China, also the, uh, the Shenzhen Guangdong rail, rail, Railway, the port, and also transport uh, facilities, all have learned to different extents from the Hong Kong model. So the very successful uh, companies in the PPB model, the first five most successful companies are all Hong Kong companies. So this will also provide a very good um, role modeling for Chinese companies. Now, Hong Kong also has other uh, advantages, legal services, accounting services, and in other areas as well. These are professional services that Hong Kong has as its uh, forte. And indeed, this will also support the Chinese uh, development, the Chinese mainland development. The Chinese companies, the SOEs, etc., when they go out onto One Belt, One Road, they need this kind of professional services support and know-how before they can do so to be successful. So I think Hong Kong will play a very important role there for these projects with the, with the professional services support. And also, there are a few directions that we can look into. One is that the, China, uh, the Hong Kong companies can participate in these projects directly or go together with uh, the mainland corporations or SOEs. The SOEs, Chinese companies, have a lot in terms of technological know-how, but in terms of going out, in terms of experience, culture, uh, and also uh, mm, professional uh, capabilities, this is where Hong Kong can come in to complement and supplement these companies, uh, Chinese companies going out on OBOR. And another point where Hong Kong can play a role is in, for example, how to improve the Chinese government enterprise and countries along the One Belt, One Road, improve their infrastructure buildings for our companies going global at the moment you know we face uh, issues of the lack of capacity in some of the PPP projects currently a lot of them are non-standard and a lot of the local uh, governments actually don't know how to run PPP programs so on this basis you know we can work together just now I said Tsinghua University, we have established a PPP research center, and we're able to consolidate the resources, and we can have some uh, talent training programs for the enterprises and for the government, and we can introduce some of the experience in Hong Kong and some of the uh, cultural uh, experience and uh, cultural training uh, to 
other governments and for entrepreneurs as well as for government officials to improve their capacity. By doing so, we will be able to improve the PPP projects in China and for Chinese enterprises going global. In addition, some countries might have different views for Chinese companies going global. This sometimes is because they don't understand China's culture, and sometimes you know they don't they lack understanding of PPP and innovation. So we can work together to train uh, the entrepreneurs and governments along the One Belt, One Road uh, region. And we need to improve capacities so that everyone can participate. In, in Hong Kong, we have a lot of cases, for example, MTR, et cetera, and they have been very successful. So those are the uh, few things that I'd like to say. Question and answer session. Um, but however, as a moderator, I want to take advantage to ask the first question. If you have a question, raise your hand. Somebody is going to help you give you the mic. Um, as a moderator, I want to uh, take advantage to ask first question. Uh, Dr. Kemp, um, I think um, there are other things which, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the running this uh, MTR rail, this is a long time business. Uh, 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 MTR has uh, an other experience such as merging with the KCR. By the way, I'm the KCR user, uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but that uh, which does not uh, include this uh, real and uh, real estate uh, feature, uh, how do um, MTR to manage it? And, and the things like, uh, you know, like a Sha Tian and a Central Line, when you encounter with a historical site, how do you deal with this is so-called, so uh, you know, social factors, the people's concern, how MTR managing things like that. Um, just very quickly, in fact, for the uh, merger, um, to enable us to proceed with the merger, we actually deploy the concession model that we've just explained. So basically, we took over existing lines that were already financed and built, uh, and actually operated for some time by the KCL company. So from that point, we took over the lines and we are responsible for the uh, O&M operations and maintenance as well as ongoing investment and upgrades uh, of, of the lines. And in fact, from uh, hopefully our customers would agree, some, some, of, uh, some of you are here, uh, that after we've taken over the lines, we have gradually uh, uh, improved uh, the overall uh, uh, service quality uh, as well as value for money. Um, and for new lines uh, that are connected to these existing uh, concession lines, um, we have the choices of either financing it ourselves, and usually in Hong Kong we would, we would prefer the rail press property model. If uh, either the property or the particular model is not available for whatever reason, um, we will then revert to the concession uh, model. So for the uh, for the uh, benefit of the audience, Shatian Central Link is actually a new line that links up uh, uh, two parts uh, of the KCL, the concession lines, uh, with, with one common uh, corridor. So that, uh, uh, the new line is actually uh, now being invested uh, using the concession model. So Hong Kong government is paying for the construction of the new line, but we will take over, well, we manage the construction for them uh, uh, at a cost, um, and then we will, we will be operating the line and we'll be responsible for the ongoing investment uh, uh, for the lines until the end of franchise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, gentlemen. I guess I, I got it. I got the microphone. Andrew Kinlock of Luggy Group. Uh, two questions, if I may. First for Dr. Kava MTR. Can you say a little bit more about the PPP in Sydney, the Northwest Rail, in particular, how you make that profitable from your point of view. And my second question is for uh, Mr. Fung at the Airport Authority. You promised to talk a little bit about another PPP project, and I'd be intrigued to hear what that is. Thank you. In fact, the uh, Sydney uh, uh, project, uh, Northwest Rail Link, is very much uh, a way of a typical uh, PPP uh, project that we're familiar with. Uh, the uh, uh, Sydney government, as well as the provincial and, and central government, so New South Wales government, Sydney government, uh, and the central government of Australia, 
actually pay for part A, which is really the civil works part of the line. So the consortium that we, that we lead uh, in, the, in the project, actually we invested, or we are investing in building part B, which is really electrical, mechanical, uh, as well as the trains, uh, a part of the investment. We'll be operating the full line uh, uh, for 15 years, and in the period we will have subsidized operations and as a result, we will uh, we have a business case. Okay. Uh, no property development in, in Sydney. Um, responding to that question, uh, I noticed from the um, from the conference brochure that yesterday there was a breakout session. One of which is about waste to energy facility. Now, actually, the second P project that we are now considering, actually in the making, is a waste to energy incinerator at the airport. Uh, you will be very interested to know why AA will be interested in doing that. Now, AA has, uh, in the past few years, has to be tried to be, at least attempt to be, one of the greenest airports in the world. And in the last couple of years, we have been pushing along many different green initiatives within the airport, like uh, carbon emission targets setting, going for all sorts of uh, you know, energy certification, reducing our consumption, reducing our carbon footprint, etc. However, as the government, the Hong Kong government is going to uh, take forward the waste charging very soon, we are thinking of how we could help Hong Kong to set up a model of resolving a regional problem by a regional facility. I think the same problem that ha may happen in many different cities is if you ask the city, a very small city, to accept a very small regional incinerator, it's very difficult because of the, what we commonly refer to as the not in my back sack syndrome. You know, people love that facility, but please don't build it you know, in my neighborhood. Now, airport authority has the privilege of managing the entire airport island. We ourselves, of course, we produce quite a bit of waste. Some of them are bought by the visitors, some by the planes. But on the airport, there are more than 15 other companies also producing a lot of solid waste. We believe we have a sufficient critical mass to, for us to explore that possibility of building a small scale incinerator at the airport. We are now just, we have just commissioned a consultancy to look into different consult, consultant, different technology in terms of ways to, uh, to, 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 um, to, to energy. Because it could, in terms of output, it could produce electricity, which again is quite difficult in the case of Hong Kong of putting electricity back onto the grid, which is a very long process we need to negotiate with the electricity company. However, there are many other byproducts output that could be used, for example, hot water or steam. Now, we're now at the process of identifying what is the best suitable technology. We also like to see that this, if AA could fund, fund up the initial uh, investment, we believe that in terms of running, the running cost of the, uh, of, of the facility could, could be self-sustaining. So we're looking into private sector investor who may be interested to run or build and operate this facility we being the investor to invest, uh, invest in it. Now the success of doing this, I think with hope, or we really hope, we set a very good example for Hong Kong, although Hong Kong is very small, but even though, even though it's so small, there's also many opportunities of building small incinerators or small waste to energy facility to solve our waste problem. Instead of requesting the government to take over the overall responsibility of building more landfills. As you know, the landfills in Hong Kong is filling up very quickly. This is a very, very immediate problem that Hong Kong community should uh, need to deal with. So we'd like to see if we will be able to help the government to set that precedent. So that's a second project that we are looking into and we hope hopefully maybe next time when you visit Hong Kong, we'll be able to tell you some good news. Uh, my name is um, Harold Inslee from ACOM. Um, actually, my question uh, starts off with waste management. Uh, as a follow-on from your remark about the airport. Um, I'm actually working on an ADB-funded project in Hunan province. And um, I, have, uh, I, I have suggested that a, a, a PPP project should be uh, utilized uh, for that, uh, that project. Um, and it, it, by coincidence, actually, um, one of my colleagues working on this job also comes from uh, Tsinghua University, from the, uh, the waste management team there. Uh, 
uh, Dr. Yu, Dr. Dongbei Yu. Um, anyway, the, one of the obstacles that we've encountered in, in implementing PPP is apparently that if a, we have a, a bidder for a PPP contract, um, his designer would have to be apparently the local provincial design institute. Now, this goes back to the issue that uh, the gentleman from Freetech was talking about, that it's all to do with method. And of course, the, uh, the, the, the local design institute will have their method of doing it. Um, but hopefully, the, the tenderers could have a different method. Uh, and unfortunately, where you, if, if the local provincial design institute has to be used by all those tenderers, they'll all come up with the same, basically all come up with the same system. Uh, okay, uh, can I, I use Chinese? Can I? Uh, During the tendering process, actually, in my personal opinion, this is the biggest commercial issue China faces, in my personal opinion. Whether it is PPP, or you go and speak to a consultant, you also need to go through tendering. Your suppliers, partners, they all need to go through a tendering process. So perhaps I didn't speak it clearly just now. The social phenomena is that you know no one is willing to show their responsibilities. Second, they don't know how to make requests. Therefore, tendering becomes choosing the worst partner. So this is what I have observed. And this phenomena is because our participants do not know how to solve the problem. Actually, a lot of us, they are designing the rules of the game, but you are not the athletes, nor are you the referees. There are simply the drafters of the rules of a game. For example, playing football, you know, you cannot use hands. This is not said by the referee. This is because this is the rule of the game. So the drafting of the rule of the game, you know, this is a type of study. But I think this is a study that is easy to master. So a lot of issues really boils down to this. What I'm trying to say is that as long as you know how to put the public interest as the priority to know what public interest means. I said just now six items. All the six items can be used as indicators, whether it is environmental impact or duration or quality, etc. These can all be measured against. So if we have something that can say the results clearly, for example, you know, someone said, how do I evaluate environmental impact. As I said, low carbon emission, the whole project, you know, how much carbon uh, dioxide was emitted, um, you know, between one mean versus another, it is easy to compare. In this backdrop, we won't have unfair competition, uh, competition. We won't help one person, one side specifically, who are we helping? We're helping the citizens. We're helping the public interest. How do we realize the helping uh, the public interest? It is by realizing uh, these results. During the tendering process, we also need to realize that, you know, the uh, young people will uh, take over, you know, the older ones at one stage. I used to be a young person myself, you know, and uh, now I'm listed. That means one day, uh, 
you know, the young people will beat me. You know, we should not bully the young people. We should not bully the young companies. You to see, you know, what kind of methods they have, innovative methods they have to beat the existing established ones. The government should support the growth of young companies. So, you know, if we have this clear uh, mechanism, I believe all the problems can be solved. You need to be clear about your indicators of your goals. Due to time constraint, it's very difficult for me to speak in detail. But, you know, it is inevitable that we will meet a lot of problems, whether this counts as a type of means or a goal, et cetera. There's a lot of dispute or different opinions on this, but uh, generally, you know, we should focus on the results rather than the means. To the uh, time limitation, uh, we probably only allowed with, uh, okay, two questions. <laughs> okay, I, uh, so uh, that gentleman first, you are the last. Yeah, you are the, uh, okay, you are the first. Okay, you, you answer the, ask the question. Okay, this is one question or two questions. One, one question. One question <laughs> to Mr. Kam. Uh, it's related to the overseas projects you have. Uh, do you work alone in these, o in these overseas projects or with local companies? And from your experience, why do you think that local authorities uh, give you the confidence to operate these projects instead of using uh, mm, local companies? If I, if I may, um, if I, of course, the, if, we, if we come to the point of um, uh, construction and so on, we, of course, would, we will employ local uh, 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 construction companies. But in terms of investment partners, uh, we, have, we have tried <laughs> practically everything. Uh, we, have, we have worked alone in Shenzhen, for example, is 100% uh, um, uh, 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 investment by ourselves. Uh, but in most of the other places, in terms of investments, we, we have worked with local uh, investment parties. Some of them are, uh, for example, in Beijing, we, we mainly work with uh, uh, the, uh, the Beijing uh, Infrastructure Investment Company, which is a, a city-owned uh, company responsible for investing in the city infrastructures. Um, and, and of course, uh, Beijing Capital Group, which is uh, another uh, uh, investor operator uh, in, in, in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And in Hangzhou, we work with a local operator. In uh, Australia, we work with, uh, they used to be, <laughs> they used to be Australian companies, uh, but uh, uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the investment, nothing, nothing wrong with our working with them, but through, through the time, they have both been bought up by uh, <laughs> foreign companies. Uh, but originally, when we started, they are uh, local Australian companies uh, involving in construction supplies, uh, as well as investment. Gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. A question for, for Mr. Fung from the Airport Authority. Um, great project you're talking about in the future with the waste to energy um, incinerator. Have you opened discussions with the CLP, the power providers, to how uh, you might return power to the grid? Because I think it's obviously a key issue in this uh, concept. Yes, um, I think the success of uh, PPP in the area of um, uh, green technology is really the um, issue about engagement, uh, both engaging your business partners, like CLP you mentioned, and also engaging the, your neighbors. Uh, in terms of CLP discussion, we do have an initial dialogue with CLP. Actually, they are quite open um, in terms of connecting the output into their grid. They're quite open about it. We haven't gone. We haven't gone into detailed discussion as to how that cooperation will work. However, when I mentioned earlier about the choice of technology, there are actually other technology that could produce other than electricity, like hot water. Now, you may be aware that actually at the airport there are many other uses, like uh, some of our neighbours, like for example, Cathay Pacific's catering service. They use a lot of hot waters for cooking, for washing, and so on. So our spy product could also be useful to our neighbours as well. So we have again opened another dialogue with our neighbors in exchange for the acceptance of what other people may think or may regard as an obnoxious facility or obnoxious neighbor next to them. We actually produce something which they, they need it and they find it useful. So I think we are trying to use this PPP model to create a win-win situation. Now we have not come to a decision as to 
the choice of the final technology and the product and our cooperation relationship. But all these, we are now starting a dialogue with different parties. Make sure that at the end of the day, the, the, the final design of the product will benefit the most of people who participate in this project. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and to um, um, conclude this session, I believe in Hong Kong's, ex in terms of the Hong Kong's experience and our advantage in uh, finance, legal, connecting, those things are well studied, well propagated. But on the other hand, I believe go through with this session and we, to a certain extent, we identify operation is also an important area to have a long lasting sustainable projects. And here um, in three presentations, we, to a certain extent, we highlight the importance of the operation. Before I conclude this, I want to um, 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 sort of uh, um, mention another operation related matter. At the College of Business, and we have a department which is a re it's, uh, um, doing anything um, everything including operation related uh, considerations. And I have uh, the uh, uh, Department of Management Science uh, head uh, and uh, their colleagues in here. So, and we have uh, Ben Ting Shi and we have a uh, Professor Yong Han Yang. They are a CTU alumni. <laughs> they are not only CTU alumni, they are College of Business alumni. And they are all on the operation side from Department of Management Science. Okay, congratulations, congratulations <laughs> to Frank. Uh, let me conclude uh, the session and uh, let us give um, a round of applause to our panel speakers. Thank you. <laughs>